Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 20, The Misanthrope, Soul Survivor. Last time, we saw the Greek world moving on and the development of new comedy under the constraints that Athens was put under by the rule firstly of Spartan puppet governors, then from Macedon under Philip II and then his son Alexander the Great. Our theatrical records for this period are sparse, and the majority of what we have has only been discovered in the 20th century. These discoveries make Menander the beacon for the period. The biography of Menander may not be detailed, but it is one of his plays that has survived as the sole complete representative of new comedy. There are only a few lines missing from the complete play found on Egyptian papyrus, so it's from this that we have to know an entire genre. The play we have is an early one, written when Menander was in his early twenties. It's short, a little over a thousand lines, lively and to the point, displaying the vigour of the playwright's youth. It's a play that has both fans and detractors, but either way, as we heard last time, we have to be grateful that it survived at all, to give us a window onto this period. The title, Discolus, has been translated as The Misanthrope, The Grouch, The Curmudgeon and The Bad-Tempered Man. Naaman is the cantankerous old man of the title, so you can take your pick of the most appropriate name for him. The play is about how he tries to prevent the marriage of his daughter to a wealthy young man, and how he becomes changed to accept it. And this is no spoiler. As a member of the audience at the time, you would have had a good idea of what story to expect. Over the period of middle and new comedy, the same stories were retold and slowly moulded into standard tales. As you settled into the Theatron at the Linnea Festival, you would have expected familiarity in the plot and in the characters you were about to see. The phallus was gone, along with a political satire, the wild flights of fantasy and the most extreme elements of the caustic humour. There were no theatrical effects and the language, although still poetic, was not of the heightened type that had dominated the theatre so far. Menander wrote in verse, but it was closer to the speech patterns of the local Attic language. It seems likely that other playwrights, and maybe Menander in other plays, used the common speech of the day quite freely. Costuming was more subdued, more like everyday dress, but the mask remained, and you would be familiar with the characters they represented. The festival itself was probably reduced in size from what it had been in the Golden Age, and the theatre a bit less cared for, but then what wasn't? The city was poorer than it used to be, and it's quieter in this season before the merchants who still bothered came to town. But the Linnea was still one of the markers of the turn of the year from winter into spring, and you were there to enjoy yourself and to forget about the difficulties of life for a while. So you find a good spot and settle down for a play by this new boy, Menander, hoping that he's come up with something good. Ah, here we go. A man playing a god has walked onto the stage. The prologue is delivered by Pan the Wood God. As he is leaving the cave of nymphs at Philae, he points to the farm nearby that's owned by Naaman, who lives there with his daughter and his old maidservant Samish. On the other side of the stage is the farm belonging to Georgias. He is Naaman's stepson, and currently sheltering Naaman's wife, his mother, Myrony, who fled the family farm after the birth of her daughter because of her husband's bad temper and moodiness. The daughter, who is not named in the play, is now grown up, and out of pity for her hard life, Pan has made Sostratus, a wealthy Athenian who's come hunting in the area, fall in love with her as soon as he saw her. The action proper opens with Sostratus and his friend Chires discussing how best to approach Naaman for his daughter's hand. Chires boasts of his techniques and success in in these matters with women, but Sostratus reveals that he's already sent his servant, Pyrrhus, to discuss the matter with the old man to see if he can be persuaded. They are just commentating on how long he's been when he runs on, saying that Naaman chased him off his land before he could plead the suit. Chires agrees to take up the matter with Naaman the next day and leaves, hurriedly followed by Pyrrhus, who sees Naaman coming. Naaman himself enters, complaining about how overcrowded with people the world has become and lamenting how they keep disturbing his solitude. He becomes annoyed when he sees Sostratos waiting and wanting to talk to him. 
Sostratus can see that Naaman is a difficult case, so resolves to enlist the help of Gaetus, his father's servant, who he thinks will be able to charm the old man. As Naaman goes back into the house, his daughter appears to collect water and Sostratus insists on helping her, an act that's seen by Georgius' servant, Deos. He spots the good clothes Sostratus is wearing and assumes that he has no good intentions with the innocent girl. He blames Naaman for putting her in danger and goes to tell his master all about it. The first act ends and there's a call interlude. When Georgius hears from Deos about what's been going on, he too is suspicious of Sostratus's intentions. Sostratus returns, having been unable to locate his father's servant. Georgius strikes up a conversation with him, describing at length how the rich mistreat the poor. Sostratus insists that, although he's rich, he is of a different cut, and the affections he has for the local girl he saw recently are true and pure. Georgius is convinced, but warns that Naaman is unlikely to approve the match. They leave to find Naaman in the fields, and Georgius promises to argue the case for the young man. Sycon the cook and Gatus enter, bringing a pile of items in readiness for the sacrifice to Pan. Gatus tells how Georgius persuaded Sostratus to dress in rough clothes of a working man to make himself more acceptable to Naaman. The two servants bicker over the best way to prepare the banquet, with the cook displaying his arrogance over his art and his elevated idea of his position in society. They're still arguing with each other as they exit and end Act 2. Act 3 opens with Naaman leaving the house, only to bump into a party arriving for the sacrifice, much to his annoyance. The woman is Sostratus's mother, and Gatus sees the party into the shrine. Naaman laments the way the rich disturb his peace, coming to offer sacrifice at the shrine, just as an excuse for a party and a bit of a feast. Gatus is sent out to borrow a cookpot from him, but is sent away by Naaman, so Sycon the cook tries but he too is refused and given a beating for his trouble. Out in the fields, Sostratus is aching all over and exhausted having worked hard with the heavy tools all day, and Naaman has still not appeared. However, he still feels grateful towards Georgius, and when Gatus tells them that the sacrificing is done and the banquet is ready, he invites Georgius to come along. Samish, the old servant, runs out in distress and tells how she dropped the water bucket down the well thanks to a rotten old rope, and then how she lost a heavy hoe too as she tried to rescue the bucket. Naaman follows her on and is furious with her, threatening to drop her down the well as he chases her into the house. Act 4 opens with Samish running onto stage again and telling Sycon that the old man has fallen into the well while trying to retrieve the bucket and the hoe. Sycon has no sympathy and suggests the best way to help would be to drop a large rock into the well. Samish has more luck with Georgius and Sostratus, who rush off to help, leaving Sycon to ponder how justified Naaman's fate is following their previous encounter and the beating that he gave him. He is surprised to hear the daughter's cries from off stage as she fears that her father is dead. At this point, several lines of the text are too damaged to decipher, but it's likely from the following context that Sycon is recounting the rescue operation going on off stage. He hopes that Naaman will remain crippled, so he's less bothersome to all in the future. Sostratus returns and tells how Georgius jumped into the well and did all the hard work of the rescue, while he admired and then comforted the daughter. The soaked, shocked and bedraggled Naaman is brought on stage on a couch. He's in a bad way and full of self-pity, but somewhat chastened by his near-death experience. A few more lines are missing here, but it's clear that Georgius has fetched Myrony and Naaman has begun a long speech. He realises that his behaviour has brought misfortune on himself and is surprised that Georgius rushed to his aid so quickly, given how often he'd abused him in the past. As a reward, he adopts him as his son, so that he will inherit his lands. He also asks Georgius to find his daughter a husband, so Georgius immediately announces her betrothal to Sostratos. Naaman begrudgingly gives his approval. Chilipides, the father of Sostratos, arrives and Georgius recognises him as a very wealthy farmer. Chilipides is hungry, so rather than breaking the news of his son's betrothal immediately, they take him into the shrine to eat, ending Act 4. As father and son enter to open Act 5, they're arguing. 
Callipides is happy for his son to marry for love, even though the match is not an equal one, but will not agree to Sostratus' request to allow Georgius to marry his sister. Sostratus argues that money and fortune are not the important things in life, and his father is persuaded. Georgius has overheard the conversation, and is initially reluctant to accept the offer, as he is only a poor farmer, but Callipides urges him to use some common sense and accept his daughter and her dowry, which he does. As the wedding celebrations are enjoyed by all, Naaman takes to his bed, enjoying the peace and solitude it offers, but it's short-lived. Gatus and Sycon think up a plan to annoy him while he's too weak to fight back, as revenge for his earlier treatment of them. They repeatedly come to his door, asking to borrow all sorts of unusual objects. Eventually, the two servants take pity on him. They describe the wedding celebrations and the women dancing, crown him with garlands, and carry him into the dance. Finally, he joins in, leaving Gatus to ask for the audience applause before he too rejoins the party. The opening prologue of The Misanthrope brings the audience to the familiar. Pan calls Naaman a strange human, a loner or a hermit, who doesn't like crowds and has never had a kind word for anybody. The Misanthrope was already a stock character in plays by this time. There are references to plays from as much as a century earlier that invoke the character trait, one of these by Aristophanes. The type seems to have been a popular one and was reused by Menander in his play Waterpot, where a fragment has a character saying, Solitude is a joy to one who hates the common ways, and a sweetness to one who tends his lands and turns from evil ways. Words that could have come from Naaman. We note that the gods are still present. Pan refers to the shrine that forms the divide between the two farms, a shrine that was a fixed point at the Linnea, so we're still in a religious setting, if seemingly not quite as powerfully as at the Dionysia. Pan's job is done with the introductions and scene setting, and he's not seen again, but his presence lingers over the remainder of the play, with his name being invoked often by the protagonists. Naaman may be a stock character representing of a type, but he's also drawn as an individual. Lonely, cantankerous and surly, his life is colourless and nothing but graft on the farm, but it's a burden of his own making. By introducing Georgias as his stepson, Menander is suggesting that Naaman's situation is a life choice. Georgias grew up in the same poverty and with the same work ethic, but is of a completely different character. Although the dramatic events of the fall down the well change his attitude, as he suddenly becomes very generous and recognises that man needs the company of others, Naaman still remains on the outside, enjoying his solitude and still grumpy. His presence makes the ending a little bittersweet, perhaps suggesting that change is possible but hard to achieve. Ovid's commentary on Menander implies that the stock characters are the real heart of his work, saying that as long as they lived, Menander would too. These characters were as well known to the audience as were the myths that the tragedies retold or the politicians that old comedy ridiculed. The mask was the key to quick recognition of the character type, but the type went further than just the servant, the cook or the old woman. The character type also had a role, so... The friend rushing on to deliver a message was a character type, as was the old agitated servant who delivered news of offstage actions. The overindulgent father and the suspicious mother are two more standard types that we see in the misanthrope, in more minor but still recognisable roles. However, Menander takes these stock types and their roles and subverts the expectation of them by transferring the traits of one character to another. When Sostratus is too nervous to approach Naaman, he decides to seek the help of his father's servant, the cunning servant stock character. So the audience expectation is that he will, by trickery, achieve his master's desire and claim the young woman for him. As it turns out, he is quite inept at the task, and the role of tricksy servant is put on to the friend of Sostratus, Chires, who claims to be an expert by experience in these matters but he too is useless and scared off by Naaman before he really gets going, never to return to the action. So the audience has the rug pulled from under their expectations and the actual resolution is much more satisfying on a moral level because of this. 
If trickery had worked, then Georgius's initial expectations of Sostratos's character would have been proved correct, but he actually wins his girl by honest persuasion and genuine good intentions. For those in the audience who remember how this all started, it is in fact the god Pan who has been manipulating the players, and therefore taking on the role of the cunning servant. So, we see the highest being, the god Pan, taking on the traits of the lowest type, the cunning servant. It's a neat twist, and suggesting of a confident hand in the young dramatist. The minor stock characters are used to drive the comedy in the play. Sycon and Gatus are a comic double act. Because they are stock types, there is little need for character development and Menander can shortcut to their comic potential. Sycon the cook is the usual character type of conceited and gluttonous and dislikes his master because he does not appreciate good food and therefore his art. All this is re-established in the mind of the audience in a few lines, keeping the pace of the play very quick. Throughout, there are changes of attitude in the characters, in the space of just a few lines. It's all too quick to be realistic, but that wasn't the point. When the audience know exactly where this is heading, the point is not about how that change is affected, but what comic situation it leads to. Although referred to as minor characters, they are intrinsic to the success of the play, driving much of the farcical elements of the action. The main characters are also based on stock types that are rooted in pre-existing prejudice about their social class. The country people, with the exception of Georgius, are depicted as mean and moody. As the play opens, the servants say that poor farmers are a grumpy sort, meaning not just Naaman, but all of them. The urban visitors are similarly stereotyped as corrupt and greedy by the country farmers who think wealth has made them soft and unfeeling towards their fellow men. It's just from the look of his expensive clothes that Georgius thinks he can tell what character Sostratos has. The audience would have had the same expectations because they'd seen these types before. But change is possible. Georgius expounds on the morality of wealth at length and bemoans the treatment of the poor by the rich. But he concedes that wealth can be retained if the rich man can also behave with integrity and justice. Wealth and poverty become linked to character, and that's important in the way that the play is resolved. The change in attitude that Georgius undergoes when he realises that some of the wealthy will work hard, as Sostratus does in the fields, and do care about the poor, as shown by Sostratus's genuine love for Georgius's half-sister, is as significant as the change undergone by Naaman, if somewhat more subtle. Sostratus undergoes a similar change when he sees the good character and intelligence of Georgius and the unnamed daughter. The play may start with the presentation of the usual stock characters, but by the end they have changed and become more individualistic. But it's Naaman who's changed least. He remains the misanthrope, the stock poor farmer, until near the very end. However, even this is a layered character. We are told that he has a large farm and chooses to work alone. The implication is that he could afford to employ help but chooses not to. We're also told that his farm makes good money and that the assets he hands over to Georgius are substantial. He is no small holding farmer but that is the role, the stock character, that he's playing. This makes his behaviour even more reprehensible especially as it has a knock-on effect. His wife has been driven from her place in the family home and his daughter is being denied her right to marriage because of his misanthropy and that could be extrapolated to say that she and her mother are both being denied the opportunity to take their proper place in society. Naaman, as a disruptive influence, has to be neutralised. And so, to the final dance. In Greek society, the wedding dance carried enormous symbolism, as did every element of the wedding ceremony. It was a point where not only a newly joined family came together, but a whole community did. Naaman only reluctantly enters the dance, but it still has the effect of reintroducing him to the community as he leaves his bad behaviours behind. After he is humiliated by the ever-increasingly difficult and annoying requests of the servants, he is given a description of the wedding ceremony. Some commentators believe that the actions described must have been mimed or acted out in some other way. The Greek wedding dance has men and women separated, 
Men danced individual acrobatic moves, while women formed a hand-in-hand chain and danced a series of set moves, all of which had to be done correctly by all the participants for the dance to succeed. The dancing described by the two male servants is the woman's dance, so it is that that they try to persuade Naaman to join in with. Clearly, there's a good opportunity for comedy with the men acting out the women's dance badly. For Naaman, being expected to take on a female role is the final humiliation. This explains his reluctance to join the dance, but he is still carried into the cave to join the wedding feast and rejoin society. For some commentators, the end of the play is problematic, as it has a slightly strange double ending. By the close of the fourth act, everything has been resolved. The lovers have permission to marry, Naaman has recanted his ways, and Georges has his inheritance confirmed. The play is done, and Menander could have wrapped things up with the wedding there and then, so why do we need another act? One suggestion is that Menander felt the need to appeal to the lowest common denominator in the audience with some base humour, and to make sure they left the theatre with a final good impression of the play. There are some lengthy passages in the play where characters take a philosophical stance on the state of the poor, the role of the wealthy, and the relationship between the country and the city. Without the plays to compare, it's not possible to be certain, but perhaps Menander worried that the play needed more balance towards the comic and the easy laugh after these more thoughtful passages. An alternative suggestion uses what can be gleaned from the little we know of the commentary on new comedy from antiquity. In this genre, it seems that there was a tradition of the play ending with the complete humiliation of the character who had been the main block to the successful outcome of the various characters. That humiliation would then be followed by the reintroduction of the character into the group, his acceptance back into society. Following this tradition means that the play is incomplete at the end of Act 4 and the further ending is required. Although Naaman has passed his responsibilities to Georgius, allowing for the resolution of the plot, he's still isolated, even to the point where he sends everyone away to the wedding despite still suffering from serious injuries. His fall into the well may have shocked him into seeing that human contact and support is necessary and mutual, but his underlying desire is still to be the sad, lonely old man. That failure cannot be allowed to be the end. Without essential change, the reconciliation with his wife will surely be short-lived and his behaviour will affect relations with his new extended family, who are all active in society and therefore care more about the reputation of those associated with them than he does. It's suggested that the purpose of this final act is to allow for that rehabilitation. Following the humiliation of Naaman by the servants, he voluntarily comes to the wedding party and is then accepted into the wedding dance and back into society. And once again, it's the stock characters, the cook and the cunning servant, who play an important part in this. It's a plausible suggestion and certainly helps explain the feel of the extended ending to the play. For all the good points we can point out in the play, there is still a problem, and it's a problem rooted in the exuberant praise that was piled on Menander by his contemporaries and in the following centuries. Ever since the full script of the misanthrope was discovered, some commentators have asked the question, why is Menander considered so good? In the unkindest reading, the play only gives us a well-used plot and familiar character types. This is not realism or significant comment on anything meaningful, but regurgitated romantic fluff. Given the constant state of war in the Hellenistic world and the changed fortunes of Athens, perhaps we should not expect anything more than escapism, and it's a work of youth, so perhaps not the best of his works. Sadly, barring miraculous future discoveries, we will probably never know for sure, but we can't avoid the fact that it was judged as best in its class in its year. So the other plays must have been, well, dire. Or is it that tastes have changed so much that what the later Greek audience and Roman commentators appreciated is now meaningless to us? In Menander's defence, and as we have already seen from the earlier tragedies, suspense at an outcome was not the important factor in the Greek mind, and this is something that has changed very much over the years. The arc of the play and the way the detail of the story was told was what mattered. So perhaps it was the minor changes in plot, situation and characters that were more appreciated and garnered what was expected. 
laughter in sympathy with the heroic characters and in anticipation of the fates of the less likeable ones. It is a model that's followed through to today, as the basic reasons for laughter are placed in ever-differing circumstances and location. Why the Romans thought so highly of him is something I'll be considering in future episodes of the podcast, as his influence pervades that period. Until works by Menander's predecessors, his models and his influences are discovered, and given the trouble we've had just getting sight of one of Menander's plays, that seems very unlikely to ever happen. He will be seen as the creator of comedy that through Shakespeare, Moliere and others is still being created and recreated today. Next time, I'm going to look at the fragments of Menander's works that have survived to see what more we can learn of his work and times. The paucity of the surviving material of any length means that this will be a shorter than usual episode, but before we can finish with the ancient Athenians, we need also to step back in time and pick up on the satire play, which will be another short episode delivered later in the week. If you've not already, please hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any of that. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 